In this video, we're going to work through a question from our 2024 interview question bank for computer science. So a mouse lives on the grid lines of an n by n grid and can only move upwards or rightwards. The mouse starts in the bottom left corner of the grid, i.e. the position 0, 0, and wants to reach a piece of cheese in the top right corner, i.e. position n, n. We want to find in terms of n the number of distinct paths the mouse could take. So although considering small cases may or may not be a good line of attack for this problem, the danger is sometimes for a small case we can handle these sorts of counting problems by brute force. But then that doesn't generalise to large n. But even you know, leaving aside whether we're actually going to try and solve a small case, let's draw a quick diagram of the 4x4 four four case just to draw. So that's not even 4x4. Four four, uh, something like this to build some intuition for what the actual basic setup is. So in the 4x4 four four case, I have my mouse starts down here, wants to get there, and can move along grid lines in an up or right direction. So I guess some examples of legal paths would be like that, or I could do that. I mean, even for three, it's pretty clear straight away there are loads of different paths, which is going to make the counting a bit intimidating. Certainly for general n, we have no hope of just listing the things, even if we try to be systematic. Now, it's always helpful in an interview question to try and latch on to what exactly is it that makes the problem hard. For one thing, articulating what makes the problem hard can help you to spot ways of circumventing the difficulty. But from an interview technique perspective, it also does show problem solving insight if you're able, even when stuck, to articulate why you're stuck. I guess the thing that makes this problem so difficult is that we can't simply say that at each stage of the problem, the mouse can go right or up. Because at some point, I presumably hit the barrier to the right, or I hit the barrier at the top, at which point from that stage onwards, I've got to just keep going right, or I've got to just keep going up. So because of this complexity, because of the fact that I have freedom to go in two directions until I don't, and the until I don't can come at different stages, any method predicated on trying to think about what the mouse does at each step is going to run into a little bit of difficulty. We could try to set up a recursion. So we could, for example, let f of a, b be the solution for an a by b rectangular grid, say, and then by considering the possibility that you go up or right on the next move, you can maybe relate that to say f of a minus 1b and f of a b minus 1 because by going up you've essentially removed one row and by going along you've essentially removed one column. Problem is solving that recursion wouldn't be easy. We want a formula for general n not just to figure what out what this is out for, say for 6x or something. Recursions are great if you've got a computer to hand but although this is a computer science question we're using pen and paper so I think that approach we should avoid. What else could we do? Well, we could also think about what has got to be true of a path in general. So in general, a path, if you think about it, must consist of n up steps and n rightward steps. So two n steps overall, because I've got to end up somewhere n, fur n higher up and n further to the right than where I started. So whatever I do, I've got to do n of each move type. That means I've got two n moves overall. And I think any ordering is going to be perfectly legal. There's no way that I can kind of accidentally go off the grid by using all my rightward moves up too quickly, say. If I do that, then it will just mean that I go along and then all the way up. So there's no restriction on the ordering. So here's the big idea, and it's a really useful idea for lots of interview questions. We can transform the problem to something easier. Instead of counting paths explicitly, we can count the number of ways of arranging the moves. So the number of ranging n ups among n right. So it's like imagine you've got little tokens, up tokens, right tokens. To specify a path, all you need to do is arrange the ups and rights. So counting the number of paths is the same thing as counting the number of arrangements. Now, several ways we could do this counting, but I think the easiest is to use the choose function because I know that I've got two n slots, if you like, that I'm gonna put my moves into. 
if I just pick which N of those slots I'm going to put the right moves in, then by default, everything else must be the ups. So it's just going to be 2N choose N. And if we want an explicit formula for that, we know that N choose R in general is N factorial divided by R factorial N minus R factorial. So this becomes 2N factorial over N factorial N factorial. You could also have seen this using more elementary permutation ideas. I'm permuting 2N things, 2N factorial, but I need to divide by two lots of N factorial to account for the fact that the N ups and the N rights are indistinguishable. But I think this way of doing it's easier. So we've got our answer. It's 2N choose N. But as is so often the case with these interview questions, we're going to now think about some follow-up problems that make things harder. So in part two, we now suppose that there is a mouse trap in position AB, which the mouse must avoid. And we need to think about how many distinct paths remain. Well, we could try to manually count the paths which don't go through the trap. But that completely undermines the logic of the last part, right? We found it was really effective to transform the problem to an arrangements problem. But it, if I've now got to avoid a particular position, it's no longer the case that every arrangement is legal and our method is completely torpedoed. Now, that's fine. Maybe our method doesn't work for part two. But these interview questions are generally going to be designed so that methods can be adapted for the subsequent parts rather than needing to come up with something entirely new. So how about we consider the opposite problem? How about we instead consider the illegal paths that go through AB? Because then we can simply subtract the number of illegal paths from the original number of paths we had without the constraint. So in general, when you want to count the number of things subject to some constraint, you can do that directly, or you can count the things which disobey the constraint and take that away. And sometimes that's easier. It's a bit like how in probability, sometimes working out the probability that A doesn't happen and subtracting it from one is easier than working out the probability that A happens. So what we can do is we can say that it's going to be 2n choose n minus the number of paths through AB. Now, this we might be able to figure out the counting for more easily. So I've got my grid and somewhere in the grid, I've got position AB. Now, if you think about it, if I want to go through position AB, I really need to solve two smaller grids. I first of all need to traverse this A by B grid to get from 0, 0 to AB. I have to get to that point. It's like I'm solving a smaller version of the problem. And then I have to solve this grid. And this grid is going to be n minus b high, because this was b, and this is n. And it's going to be n minus a along. But I think we can very easily generalize our square grid argument from the last part to rectangular grids. So here I've got a rights and b ups. So I just need to choose out of the A plus B moves in total, where do I put my rights? So that's A plus B choose A. By exactly the same logic, this thing here is going to be 2N minus A minus B choose N minus A. And because each way of traversing the little blue grid can be paired with each way of traversing the little orange grid, the overall number of ways of going from here to here that passes there is going to be the product of those two numbers. So that's going to be 2n choose n minus a plus b choose a times 2n minus a minus b choose n minus a. So with some clever tweaking, we were able to reuse our logic from the last part rather than having to come up with something new. Now, only very strong students likely in the interview would get to this third part, but we've gotten there. So let's think about now, what if there are two traps? So... Naively, you might think to do exactly what we just did, take away the number of paths which go through the first trap and take away the number of paths which go through the second trap. But there's a problem. Certain paths might go through both traps, right? Because if A, B is here, C, D is here, I could have a path that goes through both. If I simply take away the number of paths that go through each of these, those paths have been taken away twice. And that is a problem. So what we need to do to compensate, that's fine. We just add back on the number of paths that go through um, 
both of the traps. So what I'm saying is we'll do 2n choose n or minus the number which go through the first trap. And we know the answer to that because we did it in the last part. We minus the number that go through the second trap. And that will be the same as the last part, just with A and B swap to C and D. And then because the, the paths that go through both have been taken away twice, I only want to take them away once. So I have to manually add back on the paths through both. So we should always cultivate a sort of healthy sense of paranoia with these interview questions. If that were just the answer, this would be too easy a generalization of part two. So we should have been suspiciously looking for a subtlety. And the subtlety is precisely that extra term. Now, these things we know. So this thing here is going to be a plus b choose a, 2n minus a minus b choose n minus a, because that's what we did in the last part. This is going to be the same, except that I'm going to replace a and b with c and d. Doesn't matter. The logic's the same. It's just different letters. This is the only term that we now need to think about to master this problem. And by the way, this idea that you kind of add back on the things through both, this is an instance of a more general idea, the inclusion-exclusion principle. So if you like, let A be the set of paths that go through trap one, B be the set of paths that go through trap two. To work out the union of two sets, the magnitude of that union, you do each thing individually, and then you have to take away the thing that's in both. But here, I'm minusing A union B minus minus plus, which is what we get there. So it's actually a more general idea from set theory that we've just reasoned through in this particular case. Now, I guess the elephant in the room is, is it even always possible to go through both traps? And I guess no. Um, they did say to us in the question that A is less than C. So because I can only go rightwards or upwards, it has to be the case that the trap to the left also has to be below, right? Because if I had, for example, this trap here and this trap here, by the time I'm there, I can't get back down again. So I guess we can say straight away that if it is the case that the trap which is to the right is lower down than the trap which is to the left, that is actually zero because I can't go back down. Otherwise, we can just use again our grids idea. So I've got my n by n grid. I've got to get to AB. I've got to get to CD. I've got to get to NN. So I've got a little grid here that I've got to traverse, which is an AB grid. Then I've got this thing here. Um, now, this height is D because this is CD. So if this is D, but I'm missing the B, this is D minus B. And you see if D were smaller than B, that wouldn't make sense. So we've got this nice sanity check. That by the same logic is C minus A. And then finally, I've got this little grid, which is going to be, because that's CD, N minus C, N minus D. But now I know how to write down the answer to a rectangular grid. So essentially, we're done. This is going to be A rightwards, B upwards. So out of the A plus B moves, I need to choose where to put the A's. This here has got C plus D minus B minus A things overall. And I need to choose where to put my C minus A rightwards. And then this here, 2N minus C minus D, choose N minus C for the same reasoning. And then I just multiply these numbers together to get the paths that go through both. If I now wanted four traps, I could generalize this inclusion exclusion principle. You might like to have a think about that. Uh, but even for our student who did get through very quickly, the question stopped at this stage and they moved on to another problem. So I hope you found this helpful. And if you'd like to know more about our interview support, do take a look at our website.